uh, I guess it's Q&A now. And uh, I think we kind of touched on culture a little bit. We touched on leadership a little bit. We touched on entrepreneurship a little bit. But I'm happy to entertain any questions from the audience. Yes? I'm interested in knowing a cat a very simple, again, like a beginning point on finding out your strengths. Oh. Shirley asks the beginning point of finding out your strengths. Okay, so there is the assessment for 20 bucks, but Don Clifton didn't always have that. So I'm gonna go back to some really important slides and I'll walk you through the five things you can do right now to help you figure out what your strengths are. And this can apply to everybody in your life. So you could come up with little conversations, you could have people do these little activities, and I'll walk you through all five real quick, and then you can go apply these right now with no dollars uh, uh, expended. Okay, number one. Don Clifton found that one clue to talent was your inner yearning. What did you think about being when you were little? What did you dream about? And even now as an adult, what do you wish you could do when you're, when you're un unoccupied and you're yearning for something? What, it, what is it? Um, to be heard, no. <laughs> so I don't know what happened, but um, I can just talk loud. Uh, and so ask yourself and ask people around you, you know, what do you wish you could do? Have you had moments where you have these yearnings to be so? I was in Hong Kong at a leading business school and I talked about yearnings to the students and I said, can you ever think about when you were little and something happened and you just thought, I want to do this when I grow up. Uh, I talked to someone the other day who knew that they want to be a journalist in seventh grade. They won a writing competition, and their teacher said, you are a good writer, giving you $25, and then how do you want to you know, grow as a writer? And, and he said, I want to be a journalist. So she takes him to the library, shows him some books on journalism, and shows what schools and colleges he should go to. Twelve, you know, In 12th grade, he got a job writing for a paper, he majored in journalism, and then for 65 years he had a career in journalism and uh, was a newspaper editor four times. I asked him, uh, what was your highlight as a, in your career? He said, you know, interviewing Muhammad Ali before he was Muhammad Ali. Cautious Clay, when he fought, he fought in Vegas, and I got to go to it, and I got to have the best interview of my life. I said, did you watch Muhammad's funeral? He said, yeah, that was the best funeral I've ever seen in my life. Uh, anyway, so he knew in seventh grade. Uh, this Hong Kong student said, when I was like five, my grandfather took me to a market and I saw the fruits and vegetables and the packaged products and I thought to myself, I could organize a store better than this. And here's this little five-year-old. And, and I said, have you ever done anything in retail or in e-commerce? And he said, no. And I said, if you do, you'll probably be really good at it because that five-year-old yearning is a clue that you have real talent in that area. It just isn't a random thought. Okay, the second thing is rapid learning. Now that means that you encounter some new topic. You sign up for a class and on day one, it's like, oh, this is so easy. I, I'm getting this, you know, it might be physics and you're like way ahead of the rest of the class because it just comes easy, easy to you. Now some of us will coast as a result instead of saying, I have deep talent and deep potential in this area. So can anyone think of any moments of rapid learning in your life where you were exposed to some new software or tool or a concept or you were asked to do something for the very first time with your hands and it was just easy? You can, Micah can. When I was given a camera. You were given a camera. Like, go film something. I'm like, I don't know how to turn on. They're like, on, go film. Okay. <laughs> Awesome. So Mike, here's Micah doing his videography uh, for a living and thankfully being a part of the Venture Cafe community too. So thank you for following that yearning or that, that moment of rapid learning as well. All right, flow. Uh, a psychological state of flow is where you are so engrossed in what you're doing you lose track of time. Um, I think I experienced flow when I was playing Dungeons and Dragons <laughs> uh, for 18 straight months. Um, no, but uh, if you are working and it's like four or five hours have gone by and you're like, oh, it felt like an hour, like I don't know where time went, that's a clue that you have talent in that area. And so pay attention to those moments where you're in the zone, where you're doing like peak performance and, and you experience that flow state. 
Uh, it was coined by a, a, a Czech psychologist named uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. So this is a famous guy. He wrote a book called Flow. He, he's, a, he's a real famous psychologist. And he studies those moments where we are, are doing our best work. Uh, satisfaction is one that's kind of different from the others, where the others are like easy, it's natural, it feels good. Satisfaction is what's the hardest thing you've done in a really long time? But when you finish that really hard thing, you felt deep satisfaction so much that you thought, I could do that again. It was really hard, but it was so satisfying, I think I want to do it again. You know, maybe running a marathon. I've never run one, but I've run up to like 19 miles is my personal record. I, I know when I run that first marathon, I'll be like, oh, that was good. I'm done. Bucket list. <laughs> checked off. Uh, but some people, as soon as they finish a hard thing, they're ready to do the next one. Anyone have any experience with, with that? You've got it. What's your name, by the way? Janae. Yeah. Janae. Okay. So what's your deep satisfaction experience? So it's not like a marathon. I did run a 5K, but uh, mm -hmm. it was really video editing. Uh, video editing one of my videos, and it came out really good. And I was like, I'm never paying anybody. <laughs> but I was really sad. Was it was hard? Oh, it was hard. It, but it came out great. Yeah, it came out great. Got, okay, yeah. so cool. That's so cool. So that's a clue you have talent in that yeah. area to, to, to use. Now, the fifth one is glimpses of excellence. And that is when you do something and it's so good. So maybe that was a combination of satisfaction plus a glimpse of excellence. You saw it. the quality is amazing. I've never seen that with any video stuff that I've done. It's, it's like, the, I'm like, I have to hire somebody because I can't do anything with graphics or photos or anything. It's like worse than like third grade level. Uh, I just have zero skill in that area. But glimpses of excellence can also be when someone else sees you doing something and says, how did you do that? Like, that was amazing, incredible. And you're like, it's no big deal. No, no, pay attention when anyone glimpses excellence in you and realize you might be one in a thousand or one in 10,000 that can do that as effortlessly and as well. Okay, does that answer the question, yeah, Shirley? Sure, but I'm wondering if there's like a, I know this is in the box, but a standard test or something you can really do to get some results or yeah. ideas. So the Strengths Finder test or the assessment is 177 questions and you answer those. It takes about 30 minutes. And as soon as you're done, they give you this incredible report listing not only your five strengths, but a very personalized report that no one else will get the same report as you. It is deeply personalized based on how you answer those 177 questions. And how do you get that test? So it's, uh, it's online at gallopstrengthcenter.com. Also, it's on a, in a book called Strength Finder 2.0. You buy that book for about $18, $20. I told someone in the audience, they're like, is there any cheaper way to get that? I'm like, there's a book called How Full Is Your Bucket on Amazon for like $14 or $15. And it actually has the same exact assessment in it. That's the cheapest way. Now, you can go to China and buy a book for $7. That, but if you, you have to speak Chinese to know how to read the instructions. But How Full Is Your Bucket? I think it's $14 or $15. And that's the cheapest way that I know. Also, some of you might wonder, what about kids? What about younger kids? This Strength Finder is for people uh, 14 or 15 or older. It's kind of ninth grade reading level. But if you have a child age 10 to 14, there is a assessment called Strengths Explorer. Um, I think it's $15 or something like that. But it, it's, a, it's an introduction to this, to this world of, of looking for strengths. And it will give your child their top three. Uh, out of out of a vocabulary of ten. Yes, back row. Do your five strengths remain the same? Can you have like either a new strength that bumps one off the bottom, or can you take your seventh strength? Let's say it's running, and really put skill, you know, work towards that and move it up in the top five. So the way the psychologist invented Strengths Finder is it's not a skill like running, or it's not it's not like the end result of your talents. His, his assessment is really a talent finder more than a strength finder. So, so I'll just describe it as your patterns of thinking, feeling, and behaving that you can't turn off. And, and the, the test retest has a very high reliability, meaning if you take it six months or five years or 10 years apart, there's a very high likelihood that most of the strengths will be the same. Uh, there will be a little you know, juggling of it, but, but as Colleen said earlier, 
Uh, your top five doesn't fully define you. Most of us have between eight and 12 strengths that are always on. And so if it shows up as number seven or eight, it's still in your top, it's still a dominant strength. So some people get caught up in the order of one through five. It's like, you know, or the order of seven through eight or, you know, six through 10. Um, but the reality is most adult humans have way more than five dominant strengths. And as you go through uh, your report with a coach and they ask you questions about, okay, do you see yourself doing this all of the time, some of the time or none of the time, you kind of create your own uh, demarcation of like, oh, for me, my top nine strengths are always on. And I can use my ninth just as easily as I can use my first. Um, and it's, it, they all work together in tandem, but it, it is a, it's a wonderful journey to get started. Um, and and our, our researchers now have 20 years of test results. And so they're able to do long-term studies. They don't think strengths change very much, even in decades of your life. How many strengths are there? There are 34 total. Yeah. Yes, back row. Yeah. Can you, you, you mentioned uh, working <coughs> with or talking to students in Hong Kong. Um, I work in higher education. Can you give me any reference to this being used in, in that context? And second part of the question, the objective here seems to line up well with servant leadership. Can you talk about this? Good, good, good question. So in higher education, uh, hundreds of colleges and universities use it with many of their students, if not all of their students. There are uh, University of Minnesota, for example, big public uh, re uh, institution, has had all their students, faculty, and administration take StrengthsFinder for the past six, seven years. The president of the university shares his top five strengths in his commencement speeches. Mm -hmm. And they've done studies about enrollment, re-enrollment. Uh, you can actually find some of that on their website. And also, uh, if you want to email me, uh, paul at soar.com, I can point you to some other resources. But not only does strengths increase re-enrollment and improve the, the grade point average of the students who, who go through it. Uh, but it also can enhance the well-being of each student. Uh, Gallup has another important construct called well-being. And they measure the well-being of humans in five categories. And that includes physical health. We all want to live a healthy life. Financial well-being. If you're in deep debt or stressed out financially, it's very detrimental to every part of your life your career well-being, you know, are you in the right job? Do you love your job? And then fourth and fifth is the social well-being, your relationships with family and friends, and your community well-being. Do you feel safe where you live? Do you, are you connected to your community? Do you love your neighbors and enjoy where you live? Those are the five elements of well-being that Gallup studies worldwide. And many of the higher education institutions have adopted strength finder and well-being, and they've layered them together and they say, we want to create a thriving campus with engaged students focused on their strengths. It's, it's really beautiful how deeply strengths have spread into higher ed. But then the students graduate and they go into a workplace that is Ill, you know, not fluent, not using strengths, giving them negative feedback. I, I heard of an amazing woman from Kansas State University. She'd lived in that strength space for years, was thriving in it, took her first job out of college and it was a shock to her system. And she just couldn't take it. And so she became a Gallup certified strengths coach. And now she's running a consulting firm using strengths and taking strengths everywhere she goes. You, you really fall in love with this because it's so positive, And then you just don't want to live without it. Yes, right here. When I think about teams and Paul, you know, I, I do understand what you're saying. It seems like I wish it was a poker game where they give you five, you keep three and get back two. <laughs> And it's with people, I'll keep these three and get rid of these two. But it seems that, you know, flexible teams are not the rule. It's the exception. You've got a strict team, a department. You get a, a challenge from a senior executive. And all of a sudden you look at the strengths and you're not stacked in the right direction. You're really weak across the board. That's a challenge. How do you recommend doing that when you don't have a strong hand? Good, good question. So, uh, and I'll answer your second question in a minute. I forgot, I forgot the second part on servant leadership. So uh, if you've got a team assigned to you, um, Gallup's researchers for many years were telling all of us that having a well-rounded team is a uh, predictor of success. So uh, of the 34 strengths, they fit into four categories. Uh, nine of the strengths are about thinking. 
learning, thinking, strategy. It's kind of strategic thinking strengths. There's nine. And then uh, nine of them are about executing. How do people get stuff done? So teams really need thinkers and visionaries and planners, but they also need executors. And so, so that's important. But then there's two other categories. One is for relationship building. It's, it's, there's eight or nine themes that help you understand each other and connect and bond. And then there's influencing themes like communication, positivity, woo. And, and this is how you influence others. Now, it would be great if every team had people with all of those different types of strengths. Now, not every team does. And what the Gallup researchers discovered two years ago was that the highest predictor of a top performing team is not well-roundedness, but it's uh, team awareness of each other's strengths. So think about in sports. If you've got, uh, you know, sometimes NBA teams play small ball. You know, you got three or four people that can shoot the three point shot. And, and so you take the deck you're dealt and you say, OK, what do we have? Let's understand each other. Now, what strategy should we use given our strengths to get the job done? There's a cool story out of Indonesia where a strengths coach was working with 12 executives from a big bank in Indonesia and they were doing great work. Their bank was growing. They were profitable, but they had headquarter problems that their, their headquarters were in a different country and they were getting nothing but grief from the headquarters like reports do and and compliance and all these things and yet the bank was thriving the coach looked at this team and found they had zero influencing themes okay they were good at executing they were good at relationships they had zero people on the team with any influencing strengths and they realized the reason that they were having problems with this distant headquarters was because nobody was influencing them. So it was a problem. So the, the team said, do we need to hire people that have influencing themes? And the coach said, well, you could, but let's not do that. Let's use our thinking themes and our executing themes to come up with a plan to fix the influence problem and then to implement it. So within three months, they had created a plan and executed it. They never had a problem with headquarters again. So you don't have to have all the strengths. You just need to know what you have and what you don't have. Then you use what you have to get the outcome that you need. So the, the awareness is the secret sauce. The awareness More is so than having the structural correct. elements. Correct, the awareness is the secret sauce. Okay, now back to servant leadership. I couldn't agree more. I think that servant leadership is uh, extremely harmonious with a strengths-based leadership approach. And, uh, and I, I don't really have much more to say about that, but, but I appreciate servant leadership uh, a lot. And, and I think this just plays, uh, it's a tool that, that can- This could be a big part of the uh, how to, the how to, exactly. Exactly, yes. How do you think about strengths-based coaching or whatever in, when you compare it to like disc assessments and um, big five personality traits and those sorts of things, which are kind of really focused on now. So great question. She's asking about disc and big, well, I probably everybody could hear you already because if I could hear you, they could hear you too. So, uh, so um, I'm familiar with big five. I'm familiar with disc. I'm not as familiar with using coaching to help people with disc or help people with big five to kind of grow into potential. So it's a very different type of assessment. Uh, Don Clifton was looking for areas of growth and potential, and the 34 words are all steeped in positive psychology. The big five, not so much. DISC, not so much. Um, they are helpful constructs for different things. I know, for example, one sales organization that has trained 200,000 salespeople uh, on DISC, and they teach you how to sell to someone, whether they're high D, high I, high S, or high, high C. And it's a very kind of a shortcut to kind of guess, okay, this person wants to bond and has have rapport and kind of, you know, talk about our weekend. This person doesn't, they're very dominant, they're very direct, they just, so, so a lot of salespeople can adapt to the DISC style of their clients. Um, strengths is very different from what I've experienced. It's really all about your naturally recurring talents that ought to be known and used and developed. Um, and I don't see the others. Big Five is interesting um, and it's academically sound and you know people uh, respect it a lot. There's a lot of scholarship on it. Um, but I don't think it's a human development aid 
like Strength Finder is from from my experience. Yes, back row. Hi, I'd like to share that um, we share four of the five top strengths, and I want to say that we differ in ideation and futuristic. Okay. Although ideation is my number six, so my. Wait a second, wait a second. <laughs> she and you have the exact same top five, right? Um, you said, yeah, I have ideation. Yeah, input, learner, intellection, futuristic, and strategic. Um, input, futuristic, ideation, and strength. We should okay. talk. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're like strengths cousins. The three of us were very, very rare that the three of us would have that many in common. Um, first question is how did you determine to use your top five strengths to do what it is that you do, your businesses and so forth? And second question where is Haley? Because I need help with organizing my home office. <laughs> <laughs> Haley Buckner, you can look her up in LinkedIn. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, she's in Washington, D.C. Uh, great question. So uh, when I look back after taking the assessment in 2012, I had already started Ancestry like 15 years earlier. I started another CD-ROM publishing company 15 years earlier. And, and my learner, when, when I started Ancestry, I knew nothing about genealogy. Like I had gotten a merit badge when I was a Boy Scout, but I used to look at old photo books of pioneers and pilgrims and I would laugh at the you know photos they, they all looked sad and you know uh, they had hard lives and, and I, I wasn't even mature enough to respect that I was like you know my brothers and sisters and I were laughing at you know how pathetic they looked um, and so I didn't know anything but my learner kicked in and I went to like 20 genealogy conferences in two years and I gathered up literature from every single vendor every book publisher every society and I used my learner and my input to like organize it all. And then I use my ideation to say, well, what's missing? Like it's all distributed. There's no online website where you can get everything you need. So we started to build that. And then I used my strategic to kind of figure out, you know, how to build the company. My analytical is my sixth. And I use that to like track data on every click, every visitor, every search. Like I'm analytic obsessed. I, I wrote an article once called dashboard driven executives. I'm like, every decision I make has to be based on the numbers. And, and so um, I think those strengths explain exactly why I did Ancestry and why I did my first company as well. All right. Okay, any, uh, here's in the blue. So with all the research that Gallup has done, has there any, been any research or, to quantify the value that a corporation would have if they went with a string? based leadership versus the current model, which breaks people down and crushes them? That is such a good question. So what is the return on investment when you bring strengths in? Now, uh, there have been uh, big studies. Uh, in 2016, there was a uh, study of uh, a meta-analysis of over 100 previous studies. They did quantify it. Uh, I can refer you to a Harvard Business Review article where uh, the quantification, the, the, the results were shared. In fact, I can give you a URL from memory <laughs> that will find that uh, article for you. Uh, so if you have a pen, do you have a pen? Yeah. So, uh, I have a whiteboard marker. Uh, okay. <laughs> I don't have a whiteboard marker. <laughs> but it's, it's uh, bit.ly, B-I-T, B -I -T, oh, thank you. So uh, it's such a good question, it deserves www.bit.ly slash hbr dash sort. So I refer so many people to that. I'm like, go find that study. It's it's brilliant. Um, but even uh, so, so profitability goes up, 8.9 percent I think uh, over a non-strengths-based company, and. Uh, and the Cuba, they, they did a study of uh, the public, public stock market companies that had a strengths-based culture versus their peers. And it's extraordinary what it does to stock price over several years. Um, my favorite example though is Graham Weston from Rackspace. Uh, when he built a strengths-based culture at Rackspace and made sure that everyone was fluent in it, he told his executive team a few years ago, that StrengthsFinder was worth $1 billion to their company culture. That's how much he valued it as a way of organizing people, motivating people, and helping people grow. And so when he sold the company for $4.2 billion, it's like 25% of the value was because of the culture. Now, what's even cooler is all the people that left Rackspace 
who are now taking StrengthsFinder to their investments, to their startups, to their edge. Like it just ripples out from Graham to all of San Antonio and beyond. Um, so uh, I'm trying to think if I have any other, I, I had one f fun story. Uh, we, f we hired a guy in DC at Gallup named Masood Hashime. He was from uh, the Middle East originally, came to the States and, and he wanted to work for Gallup. Why? Because in 2010, he worked for a company with 200 employees. They were, they were stagnant. They were just at a dead end. And somehow they decided to do a four or four and a half day company retreat about StrengthsFinder. Like I've never heard of a small company like this taking a full week to do deep dive into everyone's strengths. And he said the outcome of that was number one, everyone's self-awareness went way up. But number two, this one woman had ideation. Nobody previously knew that she had ideation. And the executive said, you have ideation. What ideas do you have to help us grow? She came up with an idea. She'd had it for a long time, but now they asked her for it. And the company tripled in size in the next three years. And Masood said it was solely traceable to her idea. So he's, he wrote me a, a letter when he applied at work. He's like, I've wanted to work at Gallup my whole life to see who creates this tool that allows companies like us to, to, to benefit that much. Yes. I love the idea of, of strengths building and everything like that, but where does accountability fit into to changing that culture? Okay, good, good question. So as an analytical, I love to make sure everyone's accountable for getting stuff done. And uh, my favorite book in the mid nineties was The Game of Work, where it teaches you that every person should have a scorecard, they can keep track of their progress, they can set personal records. So, so accountability matters a lot. My favorite articulation of, uh, and I think it'll answer your question, is again, Graham Weston, the most fluent person I've ever known in the, in the world of business. And he said to me, let's see, uh, Tammy, he'll be like, you know, Tammy, your project's due on Friday. And right now, I don't even care what your strengths are. You just have to get the project done. So in the short term, I don't care what your strengths are. Get your project done. In the long term, I care deeply about your strengths <laughs> and make sure that you're in the right role, in the right, you know, with the right team to maximize your strengths. But we can't mess around. We've got to get this stuff done. So I think he does a good job of expressing that businesses have to have output. They, they have, in order to exist, they, they actually have to deliver results. And so he kind of says it, you know, in a funny way, like today, I don't really care about your strengths. Just get the job done however you can. But in the long term, Tammy, I want to make sure you are thriving every day. You look forward to coming to work and we've got you in the right role with the right team. He says that every person wants to be a valued member of a winning team on an inspiring mission. And I think that captures the essence of what organizations ought to do help you be a, val a, a valued member for what you bring of a winning team because we want to win and in an inspiring mission. Like what's the purpose of our organization? Let's do it together. We're inspired by it. We want to get to work and, and accomplish these goals. So I think his little phrase there just ca captures the essence of what I think a great company leader would say. Yes. So, Paul, thank you so much for coming and talking. Look taking a holistic approach, is there a nature versus nurture to predicting the outcome? Um, so can you, can you influence how a child is going to score later in life based on their early life experiences? And what role, if any, do you think genetics has to play in this? I'll just, as a preface, I'm a research scientist by training. Genetics is big in my world. Um, and I'd just like to know if there's been research to see do all achievers have this or what was their early life experience and can that influence um how, how people test so um excellent questions and i would say that uh it's clearly both that our nature uh helps determine you know we've got biological and neurological you know uh, uh what we inherited uh, plays a role uh, nurture definitely plays a role. Experiences, decisions, opportunities, um, and so as you, as you think about a three-year-old with you know a hundred billion neurons and a hundred trillion synaptic connections, and as they go from three years old to sixteen years old, they lose half of those 
you know, neurological synaptic connections. So they are less um, varied and, and they start having patterns and habits of thinking, feeling, and behaving. Um, I'm probably not answering the question very well. Um, I believe that some science shows that about 40% of talent is inherited in the musical field. And, and so we don't really know yet for these 34, you know, do disciplined people tend to have kids with discipline? Like, do responsibility people tend to have kids with, we don't know. It would be really cool. I actually want Ancestry.com and Gallup to team up someday and do a big multi-generational study with 10,000 families, grandparents, parents, and kids, do the strengths finder assessment with all of them, but also do a DNA test. Right, I, so, I was just gonna say, I would envision a day when after your child is born and they do the little PKU prick that they also pre present the parents with, here's the prediction of your child's strengths. So that as you're raising them, you're raising them to their strengths. Yeah, it's interesting because there's the, the uh, Gattaca movie that talks about, you know, if you're not like genetically, you know, perfect, if you're a flawed, you know, person. So, so it's a little slippery slope when you go back to that age, but to teach the parents to look for clues to talent early on. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't, maybe it could be tastefully delivered and say, you know, your daughter might be better at music than she is at sports. I mean, maybe, maybe something. And in addition to a DNA test, potentially, I think uh, we went to the brain and biology lab at the University of Nebraska and we brainstormed with some of the top neuroscientists in the country. And my idea was, what if you could lay somebody down in an fMRI scanning machine and ask them a question about that was responsibility related or discipline related or ideation related, see what happens, what parts of their brain light up. And maybe you could actually say you have 90% ideation according to our brain scan. Like, again, I think it might be possible and, and hopefully, you know, problem with society, problem with corporations, we find something that's possible and then we go monetize it and it harms a lot of people, you know? You kind of know that in this area, there's large corporations that have harmed a lot of people um, because of the profit motive. And, and so, I don't know, even Ancestry's own DNA testing, I've been interviewed by several newspapers and journalists, and I'm like, right now I trust Ancestry, I love their CEO, she's one of the greatest executives in the country, um, but who's gonna replace her? And who's gonna own the company down the road? And what will they do with our DNA? I hope it's all ethical and good, but, you know, anyway, it's, we live in a fascinating time, don't we? And I, and I wish I, I wish I had a better answer. Uh, if I, kids can I, a better answer. I, well, I don't necessarily know I have a better answer, but I do have an answer. So this is my son next to me. And so we've both taken um, the Clifton Strength Finder. And so we actually have things that are very opposing. Um, so his, like in his top five is empathy and empathy is my number 34. Which basically means, <laughs> it seems like I don't care about people. <laughs> And so my son, um, and it's funny because I, we talked about it, and I said, you're the sensitive child. And I'm like, ah, right? <laughs> um, but, and he's my only child. And I, a lot of the sensitive ones are not in my top 10. Um, or the relationship building ones are not in my top 10. But that would be helpful for a parent to know, okay. Well, that's why there's oh, the yeah. strengths-based yeah. parenting piece. You're welcome. And it, it, it is very important to recognize, right? Um, I'm a, all of mine are in strategic thinking, my top six. So, very different. So that answers your question. Just <laughs> yes. I hope I'm able to articulate um, this question. I have this like blob of thought around a lot of this stuff. I'm gonna try to try to channel it out. Um, so, uh, I guess if you have a like a polarity, and at one end of that polarity is um, like you're we're all already good enough as we are, and we don't need to change to like be whole and okay, right? And then at the other end of the polarity is where I have always perceived our culture to be, which is like, you're never good enough. You have to like change fundamentally who you are in order to be okay all the time. Um, and I think there's probably some truth at the core of both of those. Like maybe like, you know, the, the, the aspect of life that is growth and personal change and evolution is like important to kind of tease out some potential strengths and areas and stuff like that. And like that sort of thing. So, you know, when you're talking about genetics, right? So it's like, uh, I'm hearing this idea in, in in some of these questions that it's like, do we have a a, a set you know thing? And I'm because I also thought of you know that movie Divergent, mm -hmm. 
Like, so I was thinking about that too. Like, oh, well, this is the category you're in. So you have to be there. Like, I mean, so, yeah. and we don't want that, yeah, right? So, yeah. no, no. Okay, so my daughter's favorite book was The Giver. So I read it a few years ago. It's a fascinating book. It's very related to this concept. And that is, it's a utopian society that's eliminated war and all kinds of ills of humanity, but they've done it by prescribing what you're gonna do for the rest of your life. So the village elders observe all the kids from age two to 12, and at the age of 12 or 13, they graduate and the village elders assign them the perfect job for them. Okay, so it, it seems all good and, and, and everything and, until you realize there's no music, there's no color, there's no you know, positive emotion. They've eliminated negative, but with it, they've eliminated all the reasons why we wanna live. And so the, the hero of the book is kind of dealing with that. So, you know, predestination to do a certain thing would be a torture for all of us. We wanna feel like we have choice. We do have choice. And, and so um, I would say Don Clifton answered that question that you asked very well in his book, Soar With Your Strengths. I wish everyone would read it over and over and over again because I think it's a masterpiece of human development. Even when I joined Gallup, they weren't remembering this book because it was an obscure paperback in 1992. And I read it a dozen times. I started quoting from it and the Gallup CEO started saying, will you say that again? I, I want to write that down. That's so smart. I'm like, yeah, that's what your, your dad wrote in, in 1992. <laughs> but he said, if you have weaknesses and you feel like working on them, work on them. Feel free. But if you want really good return on your investment of time, work on your single area of greatest strength and you will get way more bang for the buck if you do that than if you work on weaknesses. But he says, if you feel like you should work on a weakness, go ahead and do it. What was that? Okay. Soar with your strengths by Don Clifton. Yeah, what all that down? Just one short little question there. Yes, I think I was sort of leading to, which is uh, since you're so familiar with all this research and stuff, have you, do you are you aware of any indication through research that um, when people explore their greater strengths, they also unlock other areas of yeah. strength that yes. like we're, you know, and by doing through that doorway, they're able to do that instead of trying to be like, no, no, no you this need to fix why, this. This is why Don says, and Don would say, don't even, don't even worry about your top five. He said, pick your one strength where you have the greatest potential. Because when you do that, that becomes the scaffolding upon which all other growth starts to, starts to uh, adhere to. So, so Don was a huge proponent of focusing, you know, for me, uh, if, if you think about, you know, Ancestry.com, this success has now enabled so many other things in my life, you know, doing one thing really well, uh, if, if you become a musician and you get invited to perform and now you get to travel a lot, you get to meet a lot of people, you're going to add a lot of knowledge and a lot of other strengths to the first strength that you have. But you have to do something to get attention and to get recognition and to, and to be uh, rewarded for, for doing something really well. But I think in the field of knowledge or, or any strength development, um, having one go-to strength is kind of, the, it's the scaffolding upon which a lot of other things start to develop. Okay, it's a good dialogue. <laughs> have you noticed, uh, um, like, when people take the test repeatedly over time, have you noticed those strengths changing? Because I know, like, if I take a Myers-Briggs test today versus, like, last week, I might get introvert one day and extrovert another day, and I feel like a lot of that has to do with my experience and the traumas I've had in my life and all kinds of weird stuff. So I'm just kind of curious if that changes. There's a technical report that shows that there's a very high test retest validity, and it's like a .72 which means that if you take it six months apart, three of your top five will stay the same, or four or five, and the other ones will probably drop down just a little bit. So they'll still show up in, in your high ranking. There, it's, it's quite uncommon for a top five strength to go down to 20. Right. It, it just It's not really as mood related or as situational. It does slightly change. Uh, the, the chief scientist of Gallup says, uh, he, he answers it this way, uh, will my strengths change over time? Uh, well, if you answer the questions differently, they will. There's 177 questions, and if you answer them differently, your report will show, you know, a different outcome. Uh, it's quite unlikely that you'll be exact on one through five on all 107. You won't answer it exactly the same. But what they do is they take eight to 13 answers, and they kind of figure out an algorithm. So 
each strength that shows up, like learner, you had to answer eight or eight to 13 different questions to show that you're a learner. Mm -hmm. And a year from now, 10 years from now, you're probably gonna answer most of those eight to 13 similarly. Mm -hmm. Like, do you love reading books or do you like to go to the beach? You know, you love reading books. Or maybe you like to go to the beach too. I don't even know if that's the question. Actually, it's probably pretty close. I'm a book junkie. You read books on the beach. Uh, hey, <laughs> that's what I do. Uh, actually, that was the question I had for you guys. So, so, so eight to 13, uh, you won't answer them exactly the same a year later, but you'll probably get the gist pretty, pretty close. So you'll still end up with learner in your top five. It's, it's a pretty amazing instrument. Yes. Can you tell us uh, a little bit more about your uh, involvement with B corporations? With B corporations? Well, I, I guess uh, whatever. Yeah, well, so, so uh, B corporations exist, and, and they're in about 30 or 35 states, and I just know a little bit about them. The D corporation concept is still on the drawing board, and I'm working with a state legislator. We've talked to the governor of Maryland. We're hoping to pass a law sometime in the next few years that will create a D corporation. And by law, nobody will be able to own, a, it's, like a, it's like a perpetual ESOP. Uh, but, it, but even the, the, the ownership will be broadly distributed. And if the corporation goes in value, the shares will have to be more widely distributed. So it's still an idea stage concept, um, but I'm, I'm working with some academicians, uh, I'm talking to some philanthropists who might donate money I'll just tell you one more idea about that. You know, we all spend money every day yeah. at Walmart, at Amazon, at all these corporations. They're great corporations. They do amazing things. They cut the cost of goods. They're really efficient. But when we spend money there, the profits go to a handful of people. Okay, so we're all kind of dependent on these. Now, if you had a, a center at a university, this is the other thing we're trying to do, create a center for studying economic inequality mm -hmm. and concentrated ownership. So you get a center, there's 130 million corporations on the planet. There's about 10 million that have lots of employees, lots of customers. So what you do is you'd study those 10 million and you'd score them all and say, how concentrated is Walmart? How concentrated is Amazon? How concentrated is the re restaurant down the street? It's owned by a local family. Uh, how about Ace Hardware? It's a franchise. So my local Ace Hardware would have a better score than my local Home Depot, which is corporate owned. So you'd end up scoring 10 million corporations. Then you give every one of us a free mobile app, kind of like Mint. Mint tracks your spending every month of every category you spend money on. So your little D corporation or D score app would say, uh, and I've forgotten your name already. Janae. Janae? Yeah. Janae. It would say, Janae, last month, 80% of your spending went to the 1% corporations. And 20% of your spending was spread out among the middle class or, or, or individual proprietors. And so if she wants to change her buying habits, six months later, you're at like 5% goes to the super wealthy and 95% and goes to the rest. So if we had tens of millions of consumers voting with our dollars, it's maybe a little less convenient, maybe not quite as efficient, but guess what that would do to the economy? Just a random Micah? side track. That okay. Is in that how do, how do you when the data when you have the when you have the bell curve when you have the average or something for uh, say something like electronics or automotive or something like that where it's like there isn't a mom and pop store that makes cell phones or makes cars does that does that make sense like how does that how would that play? Yeah, I mean, maybe there are certain things that we have to buy, like medical devices, and, you know, it's $2 million, $5 million, and so, you know, you're spending there. The B2B spending is going to be tough. Um, I think we would be surprised how much goods and services we could get from the 99%, you know, local agriculture, local services. You know, I, I think we would be surprised that with a little bit of effort, we could focus most of our consumer spending on on a distributed economic model that benefits more people but who knows until we try it yes so um in your work with strengths um do you think that's i do you think that sports teams get it right green bay packers are owned by the fans 
Oh, well, from the, you know, from the uh, decor, but from the standpoint of strengths, do you think um, um, sort of sports gets it right? And if so, Greg why Popovich is it? Does. Yeah. Phil Jackson did. <laughs> there are coaches that understand the strengths of their players and put them in the perfect situation to succeed. Um, Charles Barkley, uh, oh, Dennis Rodman. Like, yeah. Phil Jackson was like maybe the only coach who could figure out how to use Dennis Rodman <laughs> to do what he did best. Yeah and to help them win NBA championships. I think athletics is decades ahead of the workplace in helping people play to their strengths. There's a book uh, by a, a former pastor and his wife, they have seven kids. It's called Play to Their Strengths. It just came out like 10 days ago. And it's a parenting book written by this incredible family. And uh, they're trying to say, look, all of us could do better, even with the people we love the most, we could uh, understand and help them play to their strengths. But yeah, athletics does it beautifully. And why do you think this like business is not catching up? Like clearly it's a business. <laughs> clearly it's multi billion, billion dollar business. Why is it not transferring into the greater business world? That's a good question. Don Cliffin asked the question in nineteen ninety two, every Olympic athlete has a coach. Why don't business people have coaches? And I actually I just had that epiphany the like months ago because I've heard it I'm a trained coach but it was interesting because it was like okay Olympics they go based on their greatest strength or skill um, and then they have a coach to coach them through it and that coach may not necessarily be the one who has who does the same thing right so I think about Bella Corelli yep oh um, and I, I wanted to be Dominique Doss um, <laughs> and so when I think about the g gymnastics team for the U.S. He was one of the best gymnastics coaches and brought him out and they finally got their goal. <laughs> um, and so being able to do that, um, you know, it's just interesting that we don't think about that sort of holistic. You know, like maybe one reason is that when you're in business and you're in charge, you think you're supposed to know everything yeah. and you think you have to act like you know everything. So there's no humility in the C-suite. Mm -hmm. They feel like it's like, hey, I'm in charge and I better know what I, at least I need to act like I think what and so they're not humble and eager to get coached and to get feedback even from their team members and so maybe it's just hubris that that didn't allow coaching and this kind of mindset into the into the business world um, I think when you uh, get promoted there's a natural tendency to feel like you can do things that you couldn't do before and it's not always kind to other people so maybe it's just the you know human tendency uh, to not you know seek growth and and show that you have humility. I don't know. Yes. Uh, I apologize. I'm trying to figure out if I heard you right. It seems that you're advocating for the sharing of intellectual capital for the common good. And if we do that, doesn't isn't that a death blow to competitive advantage, which is essential to capitalism? Or did I hear you wrong? So, great question. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a socialist and I don't advocate for socialism or anything like that. I believe that free enterprise and entrepreneurship is the innovation engine. And, and so what I'm talking about is that, you know, uh, building a billion dollar company or $10 billion company is, is, is great. Um, and we, we need to have lots of fast growth companies. But um, I'm only going to live for so many years. And my kids, if I if I give them, you know, all of my wealth, it's going to ruin them or the next generation. It almost always does. And so what I want is uh, to make a really good living, to have a really good harvest, but then to have the the company that I created through my entrepreneurship and with my investors and my employees' help, to morph into an economic engine like the John Lewis Partnership, which has thrived for 80 years. They're very innovative. They pay their leadership really well. It's not a socialistic government thing. It's not by force. It's by choice that people go to work there. And it's by, and they vote for the leadership and the leadership is super savvy. They've done e-commerce. They've innovated in all kinds of ways. But so it's still a very efficient capitalistic corporation. The author uh, or, or John Speed and Lewis wrote a book in the 40s called an experiment in industrial democracy. So what he was trying to take is the, the benefits of democratic 
involvement and voting and, and that kind of thing and apply it to industry, which he became the experiment for. And sadly, nobody's heard of it. It's the worst book I've ever read. <laughs> if he could have given a seven minute TED talk in the 1940s, there would be tens of thousands of corporations like, like the John Lewis Partnership. But his book was so horrible. It's like 800 pages. It cost me $125 because it's out of print, but it's not, it's not even readable. So I hope that I'm not saying anything that would lead to a slowdown or less innovation. Um, you know, China it has, you know, trillions of dollars. I mean, we, they have most of our debt is owed to like China and Japan. And, and so they have like state capitalism where they can put tons of money into corporations. And, and, you know, how do we compete with that? Well, we got Apple, we got Google, we got Facebook. They got huge bank that they can compete with China. Um, so maybe there are exceptions to this, but I think uh, my, my view is that if, if Nobel Prize winning economists say that the biggest threat to civilization is growing inequality, then I think let's come up with an entrepreneurial solution to that. Let's not come up with a government dictated force you to do this or that. So for me, a decorporation is a completely voluntary type of entrepreneurship. Um, it's like if I went and started a nonprofit like Wikipedia instead of a for-profit corporation. You know, Wikipedia is like the top five website in almost every country in the world. One of the greatest gifts to humankind is this massive encyclopedia that all of us use all the time to learn anything about anything. Now, Jimmy Wales, who started that, could be a billionaire right now. But instead, he chose to kind of create a nonprofit and build something awesome for everybody. So I think there will always be a mix. I, and I don't advocate for takeover, you know, of corporations. Like, I'm totally against that. So, how about the very back? I'm just wondering in terms of the 34 strengths, are they sort of equally valued? I've been asking the question in terms of what if somebody is good at a talent, but it's not their passion? And so how does talent or your strength relate to passion? Very good question. So um, what if you're really good at something, but you don't have passion for it? I mean, I think ideally the Japanese have a, a concept called uh, uh, um, ikigai, ikigai, which is like the intersection of what, you're, what you love, what you're good at, and what the world needs. And, and so you know, we might be really talented at something that no one will ever pay us a penny for. So you kind of can't make a living doing that. You might be really good at something that you don't enjoy doing at all. And so you don't really want to be stuck doing that. So the ideal is the intersection of those three circles. What do you love doing that you are also very good at and that you can be compensated uh, richly for? And and I think it's not a, you know, instantaneous discovery. It's, it's a try this talk to this coach, you know, figure this out, and over time, hopefully find yourself in a really good role, experiencing flow more and more, and looking forward to work because it doesn't feel like work. So I think all of us, for ourselves and our kids and people that we care about, it's, it's a journey. And uh, when we get fortunate, fortunate enough to be in that, in that role where we love what we do and we're really good at it and we're getting rewarded for it, you know, that's wonderful, and then we're going to be a, a benefit to a lot of people around us. We can give back. We can become uh, servant leaders ourselves. So it's hard to give service when you are uh, underwater yourself. Mm -hmm. If you don't have resources, if you don't have energy, if you don't have health, I mean, part of the goal for thriving in all those five areas of life is that if you do, you're able to do more good for others. Mm -hmm. If you're not thriving physically, and you can't get out of bed, uh, if you're completely in debt and are stressed to, to the core to, to even make your bills, you know, it's hard to do, it's hard to do a lot of good. Now, interestingly, people that are poor generate more, donate more to philanthropy than, than people that are very wealthy, you know, so on a percentage basis. So I don't know, but, but you know, overall, long term, if you thrive in all areas of life, I think you can do a whole lot more good while you're while you're on this planet.